go through after the program, mm-hmm. right later in the week, and I will like put in. Yep, I'll put the... in the title. Mm-hmm. I'll add my thumbnail. I will enter any additional information. Sure. Now, is that something that you were always going to do, or do I need to learn how to do that too? I'm not sure. I want to discuss okay. that with Meta. I think. I think it wouldn't be a bad thing if I continued to do it. And I always mute it right away. I believe you can close out, but I usually leave it open just to make sure I don't mess with anything. Sure. And for those who have joined us so far, we have about three more minutes. I always wait for a minute or so past the official start time just to make sure all of our last minute people have had the opportunity to join, especially if they're having issues with logging in. So we will be starting very soon. Thank you to everybody for your patience. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right, it is now six o'clock. We're just gonna wait until about one minute past to make sure that any of our last minute attendees have the opportunity to join us. I always have one or two people that are a little bit late or right at that last second. And I wanna give them the opportunity to be able to join us without missing out on too much. So thank you for everybody that has joined us so far. And also thank you for your patience. All right, it is now just a little bit after. I think we have waited plenty of time. Thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. My name is Bethany Pearson. I am the program and volunteer coordinator for the Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library. And we're so happy to have you for this evening's Garden Guru. We do have Donna here this evening, one of our master Wood County Master Gardener volunteers <laughs> that has joined us for another fantastic presentation. Um, just a qu- couple of quick 
things at the bottom of your screen, you will find a chat chat option. Please use the chat option if you're noticing any technical issues, you can't hear or see something or it's breaking up really bad or there's a lot of freezing, anything like that, or any questions that I, as a part of the library, can answer for you, like if we have a book that Donna happens to mention. You can ask any of those types of questions to me and I will help you with those, but if you have questions specifically for this topic or for gardening in general, because we do want to encourage if you have any other questions with your current gardening to go ahead and take the opportunity to ask a master gardener volunteer while we have her here, uh, please go ahead and use the Q&A option, which will also be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you get them mixed up, that's totally fine. But if you put them in the questions for Donna in the Q&A, it helps me keep track of them so that we can make sure we don't miss or lose any of those questions. But other than that, that's about all I really have to say. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it all over to Donna. Okay, you got to allow me to share my screen. I thought I did, but let's take away your co host oh, okay. and give it back. Yep. Never mind, it's there. Oh, I just took it away. <laughs> <laughs> I've given it back. Make sure okay. you can get into it. All right. We're off and running, I think. Come on, slideshow, let's go. All right, here we go. Um, I'm gonna try and make myself up here as little as possible so that it doesn't interfere. Um, we're gonna be talking about integrated pest management today, is, which is a big long term, which means using uh, the least harmful way to um, take care of things that are pests in your garden. Um, it involves some organic things, but it's not just organic either. So um, we're going to take a look at what that all means. Integrated pest management is a comprehensive decision-making process for solving pest problems. So we're going to be doing a lot of decision-making um, it's sustainable and that it doesn't destroy the um, way we are growing our things in our yard um, so that it makes it possible to grow things in the future. It's a way of economic con economical control um, and it poses the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. Rather than trying to eradicate pests, IPM considers all available information accounts for many different objectives. What is your objective in your landscape? Is it um, the beauty of your rows um, or is it the quality of the vegetables you're growing? Um, and then it considers every preventative and curative option, leaving chemical options for the, as a last resort. By combining information, <clears throat> about pest life cycles and their interaction with the environment and with the biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools we have, we make informed decisions that can be implemented to achieve optimum results in ways that minimize economic, health, and environmental risks. This can be used for many different kinds of pests and it has been applied to situations as diverse as houses, apartments, food handling facilities, golf courses, schools, and farms. So a lot of times we think of organic as being something that farmers do so that um, they use less chemicals. Integrated pest management is a lot more than that. So I just read you a whole mouthful of stuff, okay? And we're gonna take a look at what that all means. Some of the principles of integrated pest management. It's the opposite of shoot first and ask questions later. You ask a lot of questions first and then decide on the action, or in some cases, no action um, in relation to that pest. It uses the identification of the pest as a key piece of knowledge, and it relies on knowledge of the pest to control it. It considers the impact of any action on the plants, people, environment, and other organisms, as well as the pest. And it uses chemicals as a last resort. So how does it work? And what are we talking about when we say, what is a pest? Okay, a pest can be an invertebrate, like a snail, 
um, or one of the other many insects we have, like the potato bug in the middle picture. Uh, pests can also be a four-legged um, fuzzy creature like deer, squirrels, rabbits, voles, moles, mice, um, squirrels. So there's a lot of different things. A pest can also be a disease. So we have examples um, going left to right, downy mildew, which is um, mildews attack many, many different kinds of plants, but they're kind of specific to, and these downy mildew and powdery mildew, these look like they're on squashes of some kind. It can be a bacteria like you see on the bean um, with the red arrow there. Um, and then it can also be an insect the next picture over, you might think that's kind of a disease too, but actually that's a result of spider mites sucking the plant juices out of the leaves of the plant. And so you get an effect we call stippling, which means it looks like it has little dots on it. And then of course, we also have pests of the plant variety, um, such as weeds. So all of these things are considered to be pests when we're looking at gardens. And it's not just uh, limited to insects, which we often think of as the biggest pest in gardens. And so how do you do this? Okay, first you need to identify the plant with the damage. Um, there are many diseases and pests that will only damage certain plants. So if you know that you have an apple tree instead of a pear tree or an apple tree instead of a plum tree or a peach tree, there are certain diseases and pests that will be um, specific to apples and you don't have to worry about all the other ones that might affect all the other different kinds of fruit trees. Um, you need to be pretty specific. Some people say when I ask, ask questions about some, a problem, they say, well, it's an evergreen. Well, that could be one of many species. There's firs, spruces, pines, cedars, yews, and the list goes on. And again, some kinds of diseases and pests only affect one of those kinds of evergreens. Deciduous trees and bushes probably are easier to name, but then some of those look a lot like others too. Um, and when we get down to landscape plants, if you know the, the kind of plant, the name of the plant, um, that helps a whole lot in identifying what the problem might be. Also, when you're identifying the plant and you're looking for um, other clues as to what it might be, look for um, things in the area surrounding the plant too, not just the plant. Look for animal or insect droppings. Um, is, are any other plants in the area being damaged by this? Um, describe the damage as accurately as possible. And this is really important if you're trying to report this to someone who you're asking to help you identify what the pest is. Um, be really specific on what does it look like? Is it all over the plant or only parts of it? How long has it been there? Um, has it changed in any way? For example, did it start out looking one way and now it looks different? So these are all kinds of things that we can do to try to identify what the problem is. Uh, monitoring is really important when you're talking about um, integrated pest management. Just take a walk around your yard every day or every other day and kind of look closely at what's growing there and look for things that look different from the last time you walked through your landscape. Um, there are two things to look for. One is signs, that's physical evidence of a pest, so you can actually see something that's happening because the pest has been there. And then sometimes we also look for symptoms and this is the effect the pest is having on the plant. So let's take a look at some of these. Some examples of signs might be if you took a hand lens like this lower left corner and looked at the bottom side of this um, uh, needle from a, a tr uh, an evergreen tree you would see these little black spots. And those are actually the spores of the disease. Um, so it's a fungus. And these are the spores that are growing and they will release spores to um, infect other plants. The middle picture is um, an example of a bacterial sign. And oftentimes when you have a bacterial infection, you get kind of oozing stuff 
from the plant or the tree. Um, and this indicates that there is a bacterial infection inside the plant. Sometimes signs can be holes in leaves or droppings from um, animals or um, insects. So if you see these little black spots, they could be the insect, they could be the droppings from the insect. So you wanna take note of, of those things. Symptoms might be things you don't actually see the past, but it could be changes in leaf color, spots on leaves, um, a plant wilting or part of a plant wilting. Um, in the upper right, you can see that the bottom parts of a lot of these trees have turned brown. Um, that's a symptom. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's causing the plant leaves, the lower branches to turn brown. This one down here in the lower right corner is a symptom too, but it's really not a symptom of a pest. It's iron, deficient in, um, iron deficiency in the plant, and it causes the spaces between the veins to get light green or yellow. While the vein, veins stay green, it's not stippling like you see in the lower left corner, it's just plain yellowing of the leaves. So this is an abiotic symptom, which we call that. This is a condition of the growing, not any kind of pest that's on this plant. Um, your next step then is to, once you know the plant, you can more easily identify the pest or the problem. And um, what you would probably need to do if you're looking this up by, um, on your own and you wanna try and find out what it is, you would research diseases of, and then name of the plant or growing problems of the plant. Let's say you are growing um, green beans. You would say growing problems of green beans and then add the word extension after that. So um, an example I have here is diseases of tomatoes extension. This will bring up researched and effective answers from universities that will um, answer your problem. It will be either a university or other research institution. These are um, tested. Um, they've been researched. And so they're much more reliable than if you just take the first thing that comes up when you do a search and you don't know who's writing it, um, what their qualifications are, have they actually researched it or did they just kind of happen to have a situation where something worked and so now they say this is a cure for um, a, a pest on your plant. So you want to go with something that's researched and effective because otherwise you're just kind of spinning your wheels and wasting your money. Um, for example, we have radish leaves with holes in them. So I might look up growing radishes or problems growing radishes and find out that flea beetles like the leaves of radishes and they tend to leave these holes like this. And then I also find out when I look, it's pretty much cosmetic. They don't affect the radish root um, and they don't really cause the plant not to produce the radish root. So in this case, it's just a matter of, yep, they're gonna have uh, holes in the leaves. Um, this is a different kind of holes in leaves. This is on a bean plant. And if you've been in Wisconsin lately, especially in this area, you know what this damage is. This is from the Japanese beetle. And they eat the tissue between the veins of the plant. And what you're left with then is a skeleton. It's just the veins of the leaves of the plant. Again, um, it's usually pretty cosmetic. Um, it probably won't kill your bean plant. Um, we just had a a seminar on Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles can destroy 30% of the leaves on a bean plant and it will still produce beans. And I can say that's true because mine probably had more than 30% destroyed last year and it kept making beans like crazy until it um, froze. So again, um, how you treat it depends on whether or not it's really important to treat it or do you just want to um, uh, live with the damage. Okay, I've got some examples of insects that are not pollinators. I'm gonna try and open these windows to see if we can um, get them to work here. Uh, let's see, I have to get out of here and 
Okay, I want you to take a look at these. These are pictures of 50 caterpillars of common butterflies in Wisconsin. Donna, we're not, we're still seeing the slide. Okay, let's see. Let's see, new share, let's try this. Now yep. are you seeing it? We see it. Okay, these are um, caterpillars of common Wisconsin butterflies. And you might think, oh, these are pests when you see them on your plants. But it pays to do a little research before you start just killing them. This one here, you probably recognize if you have milkweed in your yard. This is the monarch caterpillar. And let's see, I had this one, I had about um, 30 of these in my garden last weekend. I'm sorry about the phone. Um, about 30 of these last weekend. They, that is the black swallowtail butterfly uh, larva. Some of these um, are really kind of ugly looking. So again, before you just go to picking them off and destroying them or spraying them or something, um, you might want to look up what they are. The one, the only one that really has any damage at all to um, vegetable crops is this one right here. It's the larva of a little white butterfly with a black spot on its wing that you probably see flitting around. There's little white ones and there's little yellow ones. This is the cabbage white and it attacks all the plants like um, broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. It likes that family of plants. So that's probably the only one out of all of these that even has any uh, damaging qualities. Um, there's another, let's see if I can get these to come up here. Nope, come on, go away. Um, okay, this is another one from Nebraska Extension. These are beneficial insects. This is a lacewing um, insect and it's called that because it's a light green color. It looks kind of bluish on here, but it's a green color. And it has a tremendous appetite for aphids, as do lady beetles. This is a praying mantis that eats almost everything. Uh, so do damsel bugs. And spiders are some of our biggest pest eaters. So these are called beneficial insects because they do a couple different things. They either um, eat the bad insects or they parasitize them, which in this case, this picture with the green here, this worm is parasitized by um, a tachnin fly. And these little white things that look like grains of rice, those are the um, cocoons of the fly and they will hatch into other flies, which in turn lay more eggs on other caterpillars. And what these kinds of insects do, these um, par parasite insects is they lay their eggs on a bad insect and the larva actually eat the inside of the egg of the caterpillar, killing it and then make their cocoon and then turn into the adult. So these are these insects here tend to do that. Um, then we have another classification of good insects called, um, well, they, they do the destroying and they, um, uh, they're like demolition. They turn the, the leftover stuff in soil, break it down so that um, it can be used by um, plants again and um, sort of like what you would do in compost piles and that sort of thing. So there's all kinds of different insects that are actually quite good. Um, here's another example of some beneficial insects. This is a caterpillar of the um, ladybug. Um, and again, ground beetles. Um, they also eat cutworms and root maggots, which are things that are growing underground because the beetle lives underground. So, um, that's why before you actually um, go about killing something, um, we wanna make sure that we are doing things right. 
So let's go back to the presentation here. Um, okay, we'll start with this one. Nope, we're not gonna start with this one. All right, we'll get back to it. Okay, if you need more help in IDing um, pests that you've found, whether it's diseases or insects or weeds, the um, UW Horticulture Department down in Madison has several different um, labs that will help you identify insects or plant diseases. Um, many of them charge very little or the plant disease diagnostic clinic does charge to diagnose plant diseases. The insect diagnostic lab just generally helps you identify the insect. Um, there's a turf management lab. These are all on the handout. A weed management lab, um, and they're particularly interested in invasive plants. Then um, on that website are what are called fact sheets. And these are one or two page sheets that have really a lot of information about a pest once you identify it. Um, what's its life cycle? What's the best way to control it? Um, we also have what's called the learning store down there. Um, so just type in the learning store extension and it will get you all kinds of fact sheets also. Um, if you can't find what you're looking for there, every county has a horticultural agent. Um, you, and usually in the county seat or the courthouse, wherever the um, county offices are. And then many counties also have local master gardener volunteer organizations, which do um, identifying of some of these pests and diseases. Um, many times they have uh, what's called Ask the Master Gardener, and they're sometimes located at farmers markets and plant sales and um, festivals and things like that. So do some um, Googling and see if you can find those. Okay, so step one, identify your plant. Step two, see if you can find out what the pest is. And then step three is to find out as much as you can about the pest. Is it an insect, an animal, a disease, or is it abiotic, which means it's none of those above and it's just something like um, cold damage or um, damage due to drought, damage due to um, having inadequate nutrients in the soil. So those are some things that are abiotic and there's really not a pest involved. Um, the pest will determine which of the resources will help most. Research the life cycle and how you're supposed to control it. For example, mosquitoes can be trolled by using a form of beneficial bacteria at the larval stage, as well as using chemical sprays like off to keep them off of ourselves um, and that sort of thing. But that same form of the bacteria is not effective against fungus gnats. So um, an, an example of this mosquito thing is, are called mosquito dunks where you actually put them in a pond or um, let's say you have a rain barrel that doesn't have a cover on it and it will kill the larva of the mosquitoes. It doesn't hurt people because we're not susceptible to that bacteria. And then the other thing to consider at what point in the life cycle is the treatment or, con of con or the control um, most effective? For example, if you put um, grub control on your lawn in October, it's not gonna be effective at all because the grubs by that point are pretty good size and they're also moving down farther into the ground because it's the uh, ground is getting cold. And so your um, control is not gonna be effective at all. It's not gonna touch the beetles. They're not gonna eat it. They're not gonna be affected by it. Um, things like Creeping Charlie, the two best times to spray that would be when it's flowering in the spring or early summer and right after about the time of the first frost in the fall when it's using all its energy to um, take the nutrients from the plant down into the roots and it takes down the um, weed killer also with it. Then your next step is determining whether you're actually gonna take any action. Um, look at the economic or the aesthetic threshold. For example, if 
your bean plants have a few Japanese beetles on them and you can pick them off. It's not worth getting anything to spray them with or, or anything. However, if you have a prized rose bush and they're eating all the leaves off of it and the buds and the flowers and everything, you might want to treat that because the value of having that rose is in the appearance of the rose. So um, you got to decide whether or not you want to, to treat it. Is the damage enough to warrant treatment? Will the pest be gone in a few weeks? Sometimes the pest is only there for for a week or two, and then it's gone. It goes into a different lifestyle, uh, life cycle change, and um, it's no longer eating your plants. Um, are the number of pests high enough to do major damage? Like we said, um, beans can take quite a bit of damage before they um, actually stop producing beans. Are there any natural enemies? Um, if you spray the bad bugs, um, those good bugs will also leave because they don't have any bad bugs to eat anymore. Um, how important are aesthetics? Can you cover a plant to keep the insects off of it, for example, um, rather than spraying it? However, if again, if your plant is a rose and you have it growing for the beauty of the rose, you probably don't want a cover over the rose. Um, will other plants be affected? Is it likely that this is going to spread if it's a disease? Um, will the treatment affect the environment? Um, will it run off into, let's say, a stream or something? Um, will, uh, or will the drift run off into your desirable plants when you're spraying or your neighbor's plants? Um, what are the consequences of not treating? Will it get more serious or not? Is the cost of treatment worth it? Can you just monitor and wait? What results are you actually looking for? If the pest is minor and not doing much damage, it is not necessary to treat it. And if the cost or the harmful effects outweigh the benefit, it's not um, unnecessary to treat it either. Whoops, what did we do here? Not sure what I did. I don't even know how to fix what you did. <laughs> I don't either. Um, I'm going to see if I can escape. Oh, there, oh, there we're back again. All right. Um, then step five is to decide on the treatment. Um, we have four different ways of controlling pests. And we start with the one on the top. Um, which is cultural. And this is using the knowledge about the pest to choose ways to combat the conditions the pest needs to thrive. The second one is a physical control, and that means physically removing the pest. Usually it means by picking it off or some method like that. Um, biological controls, those are those good insects we're talking about, um, some of the beneficial bacteria that we can use to treat plants. And then we're talking about chemical controls as the last resort. And this is the one that we would probably use most, um, most judiciously or least often. Um, there's some basic principles of in, in integrated pest management. You have to decide whether you're gonna manage the situation, control it or eradicate it. And a bug-free garden is not a healthy garden. We just talked about all those beneficial insects. Um, prevention is easier and cheaper than the treatments. Some things that you can do for the pests is remove their food, remove the shelter where they live. Um, and this goes for some of our four-footed furry friends too. Um, if they're likely to um, eat certain things or if they're sheltering, let's say, in uh, a brush pile you have, um, removing the brush pile will make the animal go away. Um, remove their breeding sites so they're unable to reproduce. Um, exclude them, prevent entry or access like fences and row covers and things like that. Sometimes the best thing is to do nothing. And regardless of whatever method is used, unless it includes constant monitoring and observation, the press pest problem will come back to bite you. 
usually a combination of strategies is more effective than any one strategy itself. Um, so cultural controls, what are they? Um, choosing plant varieties that are resistant to pest injury is a cultural control, especially for diseases. Um, like we talked about mildews, there's a wide range of mildews. You can get plants that are mildew resistant. You can get plants that are resistant to other diseases, verticillium, um, fusarium, um, there's a whole bunch. And when you look at a seed catalog, um, it'll have little letters after the, the plant or somewhere in the description. And those tell you what diseases it's resistant to. This doesn't mean that it'll never get that disease but this plant is more resistant to getting it than a plant that doesn't have that resistance. Um, you can adapt your operating procedures so that the pest damage is reduced. Um, things like spacing plants adequately so that they have room to grow strong and big and they're not competing with the plant next to it. Um, there's enough airflow that diseases are less likely to happen. Um, getting weeds out of your garden. They compete with plants and reduce their vigor. Um, some weeds also belong to the same family of plants as some of our vegetable plants or landscape plants. And pests that are attracted to our landscape plants are also attracted to those weeds because they're in the same family. So you may have weeds attracting plants that are coming into your garden um, and attacking your plants that you want to be there. Um, using things like mulch to control weeds and keep the plant um, moisture in the soil so the plant can grow strong. Watering at the soil level instead of watering the whole plant. Um, wet leaves are a good way to get diseases started. And adequate pruning so that the plant stays healthy, that it's, it's got enough um, sunlight and airflow flow, flowing through it. Another thing is crop rotation. If you're having a problem with a disease, um, moving that plant to a different part of your garden will help control the disease because some diseases stay in the soil or the crop residue. Um, adjusting planting time, for example, planting a little bit later maybe than you usually do to avoid some insects that are there at a, a certain period. Most insects um, develop according to what we call degree days. And um, when it say it hits 500 degree days, that's when a certain plant will, uh, pest will emerge and start to chew on your plants and that sort of thing. And maybe 10 days later, it's gone. So if you wait 10 days later to plant your plants, um, you might avoid that whole pest entirely. Adequate fertilization, enough, but not, enough, but not too much. Um, enough to make the plant healthy, but if you fertilize too much, you produce a lot of nitrogen-rich green foliage, and this also attracts many insects because they like that lush green foliage. So just enough to keep the plant healthy, but don't overdo it. And then when you harvest, make sure that um, you are harvesting um, vegetables and fruits and that they aren't falling to the ground and rotting, and that brings in other pests and fall cleanup operations to make sure that if you've had any disease issues that you take the plant material from that year and get rid of it so that it doesn't harbor the insects or the diseases to um, affect your crop again the following year. So by doing these kinds of cultural controls, you have a great um, control over diseases and pests um, without using any kind of chemicals at all. And it's just plain good growing practices. You'll have the healthiest plants also by doing these things. Um, then physical controls. These are things like using fencing or deterrence, for example, um, liquid fence and plant skid and those kinds of things to keep um, the four-legged furry critters away from your plants. Using row covers to keep insects like the little white butterfly from laying its eggs on your broccoli and cauliflower. Um, hand picking um, the insects, either squishing them or dropping them into um, a bucket of soapy or a jar of soapy water. Um, sanitation, removing um, the sources of pest infestation to prevent re reoccurrence. Um, sanitizing your tools so that you don't transfer 
uh, a disease that you're clipping out of one plant and then you go to do some pruning on another plant and you use that same tool and you introduce it to the next plant. Traps. Um, I want to say a word about Japanese beetle traps. Um, they are, do not work. They may trap a lot of um, beetles, but they use a pheromone. It's a, a scent that the beetles can pick up and it goes a long ways. So you're actually inviting like hundreds of beetles into your yard with this scent. It's like, um, you know, perfume to them. They just kind of swarm to it. And although you may catch a hundred, you may have invited 300 to your, to your um, yard. And another physical control is just taking a strong steam stream of water, like from your garden hose um, and knocking aphids off of plants and things like that. So um, aphids don't move very far, or very fast. So if you knock them down, they're not likely to crawl back on the plant. So these are all physical things you can do too, much short of using um, chemicals. Biological controls are predators, parasites and diseases that attack the pests. Um, we talked a little bit about those beneficial insects, um, like lady be beetles eating aphids. Um, birds in your yard eat tons of insects and caterpillars every year. I forgot what the number of insects is that a, a bird has to collect in order to hatch one batch of eggs. Um, planting lots of flowers that attract those good insects to your garden. Um, providing water and things like that for birds um, will attract them and they hang around and they um, use your yard as the way, the place that they're gonna find food for their families. Um, be, uh, providing cover for um, birds and places for them to um, build nests, providing water and little shelters um, some people use like a clay pot that they knock a hole in the rim, turn it upside down. It's a toad house or a frog house. Snakes, um, those kinds of things also control all kinds of pests. Um, and you're not gonna bit, get bit by a snake. There's only one kind of snake that's poisonous in Wisconsin. It's in the Southwest part of the state, it's a rattlesnake. So you don't have to fear getting bit by a snake. Um, in some situations, um, People have introduced, like they bought lady beetles or they brought, bought praying mantises, but oftentimes these do not stay in your garden. If you don't have enough food for that insect, it's going to go somewhere else and find, um, find what it needs. So they're really not very effective. And then we're going to talk about chemicals as a last resort. Um, Chemicals can be organic or non-organic, but no matter which one they are, all pesticides are chemical. It just depends on the source of the chemicals. For example, pyrethrins come from an organic source, chrysanthemums. Um, pyrethroids are a non-organic. It's a chemical formulation that is very similar to the pyrethrin. Um, and of course, we have lots of different chemical ones. Um, all chemicals have toxic effects on something, whether they're organic or not. So you need to be aware of that. Even some of the organic um, pesticides will kill things like um, honeybees and other kinds of bees and pollinators. Um, if you're going to use chemicals, you need to select a pesticide with the lowest, lowest toxicity or the poisonous value to humans and non-target organisms. Um, including those good insects like lady beetles and lace wings and uh, praying mantises. Um, use the chemicals in such a way as to prevent or minimize undesirable environmental effects. So instead of just spraying wholesale an area, you actually spray an individual plant. Using the lowest effective amount of a pesticide and using calibrated spray equipment so you know that you're using the right amount and following all label directions and restrictions. Pesticides also um, come, have different kinds of chemicals in them, some, are, some of which are more effective against some plants than others. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. And then step six is evaluate the results. 
Did you actually solve the problem? Um, has there been any damage to your good plants? Um, will you have to do anything else or it was a problem solved? Um, could you do something in the future that you would not have to use that chemical um, approach, let's say some cultural or mechanical things? Keep records for future years. For example, if you know that every year about the 10th of July, a certain bug or a certain disease um, starts showing up in your garden, you can start taking preventative action before that point. Um, keeping records of where you planted plants in your vegetable garden so you can rotate crops um, are examples of some of the benefits of keeping records for future years. I wanna talk a little bit more specifically about diseases now. It seems like a lot of the things we've been talking about have been insects and that sort of thing. Um, diseases actually um, are a little bit more specific. Um, in order to have a disease happen, like you see this disease triangle here, you have to have a susceptible host. That means the plant that's going to get the disease. For example, um, let's say you have cucumbers, okay? And it, they're going to, they always get uh, mildew on them. Um, you, the pathogen would be the mildew. In other words, it's the disease that's going to cause the problems. And then you also have to have a conducive environment. So you need to have weather conditions and that sort of thing. Um, for example, if you have overcrowded um, plants and the spacing is not good, that's a conducive environment for some diseases to happen. If any one of these three things is missing, you will not have the disease. You can imagine pulling this pink um, circle out of here and the middle disease part will not be there anymore. So what can you do um, with a disease triangle? First of all, as far as the host goes, you can try to find plants that are resistant to the problem that you have. So um, mildew resistant cucumbers, for example, um, fusarium resistant tomatoes. Uh, you know, so you're looking for a plant then that's gonna be less likely to react to this pathogen. Um, what can you do about the pathogen? Cleaning up, um, the residue in the garden at the end of the year. Um, sometimes the pathogen comes in on wind and there's really nothing you can do about it. So you have to do all you can to control the other two parts of the triangle so that when the pathogen shows up, your plants are strong and can withstand it better. Um, the conducive environment, this includes things like spacing plants out far enough, pruning so they have good airflow, um, getting the weeds, all those cultural things we talked about that you can change the environment somewhat um, to make the plants have better growing conditions and less likely that the pathogen is going to be able to develop. Um, weeds is another category of pests. Um, ID the weed before you start any treatment. Make sure that you know what you're treating. Um, the treatment's going to depend on whether the weed is an annual or a perennial, a monocot or a dicot, and its growth habit. It's also going to depend on the location of the weed in relation to your desirable plants. Is it something that's growing all through your perennial garden, for example? Or is it uh, something in your vegetable garden where it's probably an annual weed because every year if you... Um, start planting your garden over again and you clear out all the weeds, the weeds have to start growing all over again for that year. So what do some of these other terms mean? An annual weed is one that will start from seed, grows up to be a plant, probably has a flower on it, sets seeds and dies when it freezes. A perennial is a, a weed that it grows one year and the top dies back probably when it freezes but the root and the underground part remains alive. And so the next year it just continues growing where it left off the year before. Um, and it may not flower for two years, it may flower every year, you don't know. A monocot is a seed that produces one shoot when it first germinates. And examples of this are grass, corn, onions. 
And a dicot is a plant that produces two first leaves when the seed sprouts. And these two kinds of different plants are treated by different kinds of um, pesticides, for example. Um, and many times they determine what the growing conditions are. So if you've got a lot of grass growing among your perennials, you will use a different kind of control than if you have a lot of broadleaf weeds growing between your perennials. And then the growth habit too, does this plant have lots of underground rhizomes that if you just pull the top off, you're not getting rid of the plant um, or can you pull the whole plant out? Some have really long tap roots like um, dandelions. If you've ever pulled dandelions, you know they can grow um, a foot or more underground. And if you leave any part of that root in the ground, it's going to sprout again. So um, cultural control methods for weeds. Um, weeds in lawns, if you mow the lawns high, like at least three inches. Um, if you cultivate and weed garden beds, um, mulch. Don't let weeds go to seed. Um, there's an old saying, one year's seeds is seven years weeds. So um, once you let them go to seed, you're gonna have to do a lot more weeding the following year. Sometimes changing where plants are growing or the amount of shade or sun um, will help the plants better adapt and keep weeds down. For example, if you can't grow grass under a, a dense canopy of a tree, Try some other kind of ground cover or just mulch the area um, um, because you're going to be perpetually weeding and not get any grass to grow anyway. Um, biological, very limited treatments for weeds. And of course, the chemical treatments we have, these are some of our most um, numerous uh, herbicides uh, that we find in garden centers and hardware stores and that sort of thing. Um, Broadleaf chemical controls, those control all those dicots. Grass controls control only the grasses and they probably won't touch the um, uh, dicots. And then we have total vegetation, things like Roundup, glyphosate. Then there's another kind of chemical control um, that's called a pre-emergent. And this you put before the weed starts to germinate. Um, crabgrass preventer is an example of a pre-emergent. You put that down before the crabgrass germinates and it keeps it from germinating and then you don't have crabgrass in your lawn. There are organic weed control products, um, many of them made with um, essential oils like clove oil. Some people use salt and vinegar. Um, they're not very effective. They have to be used many times and if you're putting like salt and vinegar on your soil, that's not probably good for the soil. Um, some of the plant oil ones like clove oil, it just kills the top of the weed but doesn't kill the, the roots. So let's give you an example of what this looks like if you're gonna be using um, integrated pest management in your garden. You go out to your garden one day and you notice that the broccoli leaves have holes chewed in them. You have your garden fence, so it's probably not an animal um, you look around, it seems to be only two plants next to each other that seem to have these holes in the leaves. You look around for insects, don't see anything like that. You look up an article from the UW um, extension page on growing broccoli and you find out that that green larvae of the cabbage butterfly makes these kinds of holes. So you go on out and you look at your plants again and sure enough, you find some little dark pellets um, kind of in the crevices where the leaves attach to the stem and that's called frass, in other words, worm poop. And now there's two more plants that you notice that have leaves in them. There are holes in the leaves. So um, looking further, you do find one small green worm, but by golly, they're really hard to find because they're small and they're exact same color as the leaves. Take it back inside to compare to a picture you find and research that, yep, it's a white cabbage butterfly uh, larva. Now you do some research on what the control measures are for this pest. You find out that you could have covered the plants with an insect barrier because broccoli doesn't need to be pollinated to produce a head. 
You also find out that this is mostly a cosmetic problem unless there are many, many of them chewing on the broccoli. Um, you decide to wait and see what happens. Pick off any worms that you can find. By the next week or the following week, your plants have quite a bit of damage, so you decide they need some treatment. You could grab a can of bug spray, but you also note that there's a biological control that's available and effective. You can spray them instead with this biological bacteria called Bt, and it says to cover the upper and lower leaves. So you spray that just like you, like the direction says, you monitor it and you reapply it after the, any, any heavy rain. And next year you put insect barrier on your garden list so that you can cover them and you don't have to go through this bother of spraying. So that would be an example of using integrated pest management um, to avoid the use of um, chemicals as much as possible. Um, another example. Last year, your tomatoes developed septoria leaf spot. It's a very common disease on tomatoes. Um, there is no really resistant varieties. No, I take that back. There is one or two now. I know I tried one um, a year ago and the tomato didn't taste real good and it's still got septoria leaf spot. So, um, but anyway, last year you noticed that it got septoria leaf spot and it reduced the number of uh, tomatoes you got because the plants lost all their leaves in midsummer, And you couldn't do much about the fact that you planted them too close last year, but this year you are allowing more room between the plants. You also found out last year that watering overhead, like with a sprinkler or just watering the plant with a watering can, but getting leaves wet increases the likelihood of this disease. And so you started watering at the soil level, but it was too late last year. Um, you mulched the plants this year with some chopped straw and decided to prune off the lower leaves for better airflow and to keep the soil from splashing on the leaves in a heavy rain. You also put cages around your tomatoes so that they weren't sprawling all over the ground. And you did a soil test in the spring and amended it as the soil instructions um, dictated. And then you didn't over fertilize the plants. So you got lots of nice looking tomato plants, not overly green um, foliage, lots of nice tomatoes and everything's looking good until the middle of August. Then you begin to notice a few of those septoria leaf spots on some of the bottom most leaves. You prune off those leaves and discard them in the trash. And although your plants did get septoria leaf spot this year, your harvest was great. And next year you're gonna plant those tomatoes in a new spot. So you see that this person um, applied a whole lot of cultural controls in order to increase the likelihood of having a successful crop of tomatoes. Um, I wanna talk about also um, safe use of chemicals. Um, every chemical package has a label on it with instructions on how it's to be used, where it's to be used, when it's to be used, when it's not supposed to be used. Um, any of the precautions you're supposed to take, that label is the law. You have no recourse if you have not followed the label directions exactly. So be sure you read the entire label before you use it. It's going to tell you what things that chemical will control, um, what plants it's safe to use it on, um, and it will also tell you if there are some plants it should not be used on. Sometimes um, people don't look at labels, they go out and spray the plant and this plant dies and they say, what happened? Well, you weren't supposed to use it on that kind of plant. Um, use at recommended rates. This is just like um, uh, medicines. If some is good, more is not necessarily better. Um, apply selectively, in other words, only to the plant with the problem and not spraying over a wide area. Even in um, weed control in lawns, instead of spraying the whole lawn, walk your lawn and spray only where the weeds actually are. Apply under safe conditions. Um, certain, well, if you're spraying a chemical um, on a day like today when the wind is really high, this would be a very, very unsafe um, condition under which to apply that uh, chemical. It would be spraying on you. The wind would be um, having it land on your skin. You, you know, 
your face and that sort of thing, as well as being spread over a lot of plants that you didn't intend it to be spread under. Um, some plant uh, chemicals are also very volatile, which means they um, go from the liquid in the sprayer into a vapor and that vapor can travel and land on plants and kill them sometimes some ways away from where um, you are actually spraying. Remember to wear protective clothing, footwear and eyewear and heed the warnings about applying where water may run off. Many of these um, chemicals harm aquatic life, um, fish and other invertebrates that are in the water. And also note whether or not it can be sprayed on vegetables. Um, and if it can be sprayed on vegetables, it'll tell you how many days you need to wait before you can um, harvest those vegetables and eat them. So um, the chemicals are really a serious thing and many people don't look at that as being very serious. They just go to the store, grab a jar or a jug or a container or something and go home and use it. Um, Every pesticide label has an active ingredient listed. In this case, this orange arrow is showing that this is Bacillus thuringiensis galeriae. Um, and this um, actually controls beetles. This is one of the few things that will control Japanese beetles and the larvae. Um, every label also has restrictions that tells you things you should not be spraying or doing with this chemical. And then it also tells you what it's effective against. So if you don't see the pest on the label, spraying with it isn't gonna do any good um, because it will not um, kill the pest that you're after. Um, even um, broadleaf herbicides, some of them work better on some plants than on other plants. Um, law, weeds in lawns, um, there's uh, three or four major chemicals in weed killers. Make sure that the weed killer that you decide to use has the chemical in it that actually affects the weed you're trying to spray. Because not all of them affect all of the weeds. So you might spray your whole lawn and find out that the weeds you were trying to control were ones that weren't even affected by the pesticide. So in conclusion, Integrated pest management is a decision-making process that starts with identifying the pest, the plant and the pest, determines if the pest needs control or not, uses knowledge about the plant and the pest to control it, uses the least hazardous method to control the pest, respects the environment, people, animals, plants, etc., while controlling the pest, uses chemicals as the last resort and only if necessary, and recognizes that organic and non-organic chemicals are all chemicals and are all toxic to something. And it can be used to control pests in homes, yards, gardens, as well as commercial crop production. And so with that, um, I'm going to leave you again with the researching tips. If you're looking for information about a pest or a way to control it, um, remember to put in your search request and add the word extension after it. This will bring those researched and tested um, articles up to the top of the list. Um, then choose an article uh, from the list that is either from Wisconsin or a state near Wisconsin like Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, or has a similar growing climate such as Cornell in New York, Penn State, um, and some of those that are in the same type of growing uh, uh, zone as we are. And this information has been tested and researched and it's reliable so you can count on it um, working as recommended. And if you use other sites, compare their recommendations to an extension or university site before using. There's probably thousands of gardening sites out there and everybody's got the product that they want to sell um, or they've got some advice that they think they're gonna give you and they get paid by the number of people who make hits on their site, blah, blah, blah. Um, so make sure that you're using uh, reliable methods, safe methods um, and using this extension as uh, an ending on any of your searches will help you avoid all those quack sites that are out there. 
Um, anybody have any questions? I'm going to stop my share so I can, oh, maybe I can see the questions up here too, see if there's anything in there. Anybody? So far, I don't see anything and we didn't have anything come through while we were doing the presentation. So we'll give the people that are here a few moments in case they're currently typing while I'm talking because half the time that's what's happening. So it's a complicated topic, um, but I think it's a really important one because you know, we have so many environmental issues and if we can do things in our own yard to avoid some of the, adding to some of the problems, um, I think it's always a good thing. Yeah, and more and more people are becoming more and more conscious of this topic and wanting to think about it more when they're doing their gardening. So it's a lot of information as well that you were able to give them. So I could very much see them being like, I need to digest what I've just yeah. watched. <laughs> I'll yeah. come back later. <laughs> yeah. Um, we did have Barb uh, that commented. Thank you, Donna. Very helpful information. So I have a feeling we're not going to have any questions. I haven't seen anything else, but we'll just wait one more moment. Um, as I kind of alluded to, if you end up having any questions later on, you can go ahead and send them in. You can either email me, comment on the video since we'll have it on YouTube. Um, but if you want to just email me, I can get it to Donna. She can help point you in the right direction. Or if it's an easy enough question, she can answer it for you right away. Um, but my email is bpearson, P-I-E-R-S-O-N, at Marshfield Library dot org. And I do have a question possibly. So Barb said I used vinegar for weeds but not as strong an impact. Yes that is, that is um, true because you're probably only killing the top part of the weed and so the root is remaining live and it's going to grow back again. You probably need uh, re- uh, repeat um, several times and then again it's not probably going to be real effective. It also depends on the kind of weed if it's got like rhizomes and things under the ground like uh, uh, quack grass and thistles and that kind of thing. Um, just treating the top of the weed isn't going to do anything. So Barb also commented very useful presentations. So I want to make sure I pass that on. Okay. <laughs> All right, just one more moment in case we have any follow-up comments or questions here, but I think we are winding down. I wish you would do the thing where it shows the little dots if somebody's typing somewhere, so I would know. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, if any of the participants on, if there are topics that you would like to see addressed in the future, or you can also put those in the Q&A. Um, that will give me some ideas of topics that you might wanna learn about in the future. I haven't seen anything come through yet for any more questions, but I'll give a moment just in case somebody has had an idea that they want to let us know that they'd like to hear about. All right, it looks like that is going to be it for this evening. Thank you so much, Donna, for joining us. And thank you to all of our attendees that joined us, joined us this evening. As I mentioned, if you wanna reach out because we have further questions, or if you think of a topic that you would love to see us cover upcoming in one of the following months, please let us know. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.